my name is Claire Parkinson and I'm a scientist here at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. And I'm going to be speaking with you today about some of the ways in which math is used for our analyses of satellite data. When I was a child, my favorite subject was always math, so I'm really pleased to be able to speak with some math students today. NASA, in addition to the magnificent things it's doing with outer space uh, studies and magnificent things with humans in space, also does a lot of Earth sciences. We have 17 Earth observing satellites in orbit as of May of 2013, and uh, more now because some others have been launched. But all these satellites are collecting data about the Earth, and they're collecting data about all sorts of different elements of the Earth collecting data about hurricanes and volcanoes and um, sea surface temperature and phytoplankton in the oceans and sea ice and land ice and um, atmospheric chemistry, all sorts of things. Every one of them requires math in order to analyze the data. My specialty is sea ice. We have specialists in Goddard on all those different topics. Mine is sea ice, and so therefore I'm going to use sea ice today to illustrate what we're doing with math in um, the satellite data analyses. But the math is being used in all those other topics also. So a lot of satellites going around, and as they go around, they collect data. And you'll see, if you look at these enough, you'll see that they have different orbits. And that's because some of them are meant for looking at the tropics, and so therefore those orbits won't be going all the way up to the poles, and others are meant for global observations. So depending on what your topic is that you're interested in, the satellite orbit might be quite different. But we have lots of satellites up, they're all collecting data, and they collect data as they go along. Now, since my specialty is sea ice, um, I want to first of all show you what sea ice is. Sea ice is ice that's in the sea. It was formed by the freezing of seawater, and it's floating around in the sea. So it moves around because the winds blow it and the currents blow it. But this is a typical picture at the edge of the sea ice. Here are some other pictures of sea ice just to give you a flavor. I mean, sometimes the sea ice flow is really big and um, here it's big and solid enough so that you can land a helicopter on it. You can even land a plane on um, sea ice flows if they're big enough. Uh, so this just gives you a perspective of what sea ice is. And as you'll notice, in some regions, the sea ice is pretty compact in terms of it's covering pretty much the whole area. In other regions, it's only covering a portion. This becomes crucial for us. We want to know what portion is being covered in each area that we're looking at, because where the sea ice is does matter to the rest of the climate system. If you notice sea ice is really white and bright, that's because it's reflecting the sun's radiation that comes down, whereas the oceans pretty much absorb it. This makes a big difference in climate. So we want to know what fraction or percentage coverage we have of sea ice. And that's kind of our basic product as the satellite orbits around the Earth, and now uh, here's, this is Greenland here, this is the North Pole area here. This black region is missing data. We don't have any data there because the satellite didn't get all the way to the pole. It got close to the pole, but not all the way. So we don't have any data there. But the rest of the region, and again, that's Greenland, this is Alaska, Canada, and this is uh, Europe and Asia. So um, the satellite's going around, it's collecting data, and this picture over here is a blow up of the Hudson Bay region, which is right here, just so that you can see how we've got little pixels, and we call them pixels, sometimes people will call them grid squares, but the whole picture is um, got grid squares all over it, and in each of the grid squares, we've colored it such that the color shows you the percent coverage of the ice. And the term for percent coverage of the ice is sea ice concentration. We're going to use that term over and over in the next several slides. So sea ice concentration just means the percent aerial coverage of the sea ice. So um, the computer is able to 
color code these so that each color indicates how compact the sea ice is in terms of percent aerial coverage. This type of picture with a full color scale like that is really valuable to scientists because we want to see a lot of the details in there. However, a lot of people get confused by all those colors, and so they much prefer when we change the color scale so that it only goes from blues and whites. So white would be pretty much 100% covered by sea ice, and the deeper blues is less and less sea ice coverage. So I'm going to use a lot of these pictures. And what we get the computer to do, this is November of 1978 results. And I use that to start out with because that's the beginning of our long-term record of sea ice coverage. And for this picture, we got the computer to scan every one of those pixels or grid elements. And there are over 130,000 pixels on this picture. So if we were to do it by hand, this would be a very major task. Well, the computer can zip through all this really easily. So they zip through each one of the pixels. And wherever the pixel is greater than 15%, in other words, the deep blues up to the whites here, wherever the pixel indicates greater than 15% of ice concentration, then the computer adds the area of that pixel in order to get a final result, which is the area of the sea ice coverage indicated here. Now, we tell the computer that, like, on the lakes, which you see several lakes around here, not, not to count the lakes, uh, because we're just talking about sea ice. And we also tell the computer that even though we don't have data here, we're pretty sure it's covered by sea ice. And so we count that as sea ice, too, uh, in order to get our answer. And in this case, for this picture, the answer is 11.7 million square kilometers. The, to give you a perspective on that, the area of the United States is 9.4 million square kilometers. So the amount of sea ice is covering an area that's quite a bit greater than the area of the United States. So it's a lot of coverage of sea ice. So we take that point the, uh, and we plot it on a plot. And we're going to fill up this plot in a little while here. But so we plot the first point for November of 1978. And then we move on to the next picture. And the next picture is December of 78, because we're going to do it month by month plots. So we move to De December from November. And the November one is repeated here. It's the same one you just saw with the 11.7 million square kilometers. But look in December. If you look at this region here, where there's no ice in November, look at this lot of ice in December. And then over here, Hudson Bay, where there was this portion of Hudson Bay that had no ice, well, now Hudson Bay's all filled up with ice. So if you look at several regions, you can see there's quite a bit more ice in, the, in December. And this makes sense, because November to December, you're in autumn, and you're going toward winter. By the end of December, you're in winter. So it makes sense. The sea ice cover is growing, because it's getting colder. Um, and indeed, if, when the computer zips through all these points and adds up to find the area of the, the coverage of the ice, the ice extent ends up now being 13.6 million square kilometers, so quite a bit more than the 11.7. So we go ahead and we plot that 13.6 on our plot. And we keep doing this. And we do it for the first 12 points. And if, if you look here, it's just, when you look at it this way, it's kind of like just a jumble of points. Look at how improved it becomes if you simply take the exact same picture, but you add lines to connect one month to the next. Just adding the lines, it becomes this much clearer picture that now you've got November, December, January, February, March. March is the high point here. April, May, June, July, August, September. So September is the low, and then October. Uh, it turns out that as you do this, year after year after year, almost always March has the most ice, and September has the least ice. 
And so because of that, I'm going to show you this March and that September picture just so you can get a sense of the sea ice coverage in the um, Arctic region going from a maximum that looks roughly like this picture on the left to a minimum that's got much, much less ice on the right here. So that's maximum to minimum. And then other things you can see in this picture would be, uh, if, if you think about like the latitudes of where the ice is, you see that it's going up pretty high latitudes without ice in this region just to the rest of Scandinavia. Um, well, that's because of the warm current from the Gulf Stream and the North Atlantic current. They come up and they bring warm um, waters up in this region. And it's the same reason why England, although it's much higher latitude than a state like Vermont, um, it tends to have a much milder climate, and that's the effect of the Gulf Stream. So you can see just from the sea ice distribution, you can see some of the uh, longer, larger term climate effects here. But so we've got maximum, minimum, and then we had the computer go through the entire record. And in this uh, animation here, we go up through the, till the end of 2012. So we start from our beginning in November of 1978, and we go up to the end of 2012. And you can see how um, every year, way, way, way more ice in the winter than in the summer. Uh, but you can also see that there are differences. There are a lot of differences. It's not like every year it gets up to the same height and down to the uh, same level. And so I'm going to take just those two points. These are two Septembers, one right after the other in 2006 and 2007, just to show you the kinds of differences that you can have. So here's 2006 on the left, which had a higher sea ice extent, and 2007 on the right. And you can see, yeah, there's a big difference, even though it's the same time of year. Both of them are September. But there's way more ice here than here. And some of this difference from one year to another is simply because of how the winds were blowing. Here, the winds were pushing the ice this way. So the ice was kind of building up uh, along Greenland and the northern Canadian islands. So sometimes it's the effect of the winds. But one thing that's kind of neat here, um, now these are monthly averages. So it's not actually the minimum. But if you go to the minimum uh, in the middle of the month of September in 2007, you actually would see a really clear path all the way through. That's the Northwest Passage. So in 2007, you could have easily gone through a Northwest Passage without needing an icebreaker or anything like that. So. Um, now we turn to the Antarctic. So now we turn to the southern hemisphere, and you'll see there are going to be some clear differences in the southern hemisphere. But we use the same data set. We use the same analysis techniques. So um, left here, we've got the uh, November of 1978, again, the beginning of our record. And we've got it in the full color scale. Um, on the right, we've got the blue-white color scale. So they're both showing the same information. It's just that the full color scale really gives you many more details. But the blue-white color scale is perfectly good also. And uh, we have the computer, again, scan through every single pixel here. And uh, it comes up now with an extent of 15.8 million square kilometers. This little bit right here is the very tip of South America. This is the continent of Antarctica. So uh, 15.8 million square kilometers. So we plot that point. Uh, and again, we're going to come up with the same kind of plot for the Antarctic sea ice extents that we did for the Arctic. So we've got that point for our first data point, November of 1978. We're going to look at the next month, which is December of 1978. And look at the huge difference. If you think back to the Arctic case, in the Arctic, we were in autumn going into winter. Well, this is the southern hemisphere, so 
The seasons are exactly the opposite. So instead of being autumn going into winter, November is springtime in the Antarctic, and we're going into summer by the end of December. So naturally, we're losing ice cover from November to December instead of gaining it. And you could see how this is much less, and in fact, there's this big area of open water right in the middle of the ice cover as the ice cover begins to decay, and same thing over here. But you could, if you look around the edges too, you could see like in this region here, much more ice there than by the end, by in the December picture. So um, the November extent, this picture had been 15.8 million square kilometers, which we got in a couple of slides ago. And now this one, which we can see is much less. And when the computer uh, does its calculations, it comes out 10.4 million square kilometers. So we go ahead and plot the 10.4 million square kilometers. And then we continue to plot the uh, rest of the 12 months for the first full cycle. And we get November, December, January, February. February, right there, is the minimum. So February is the least. March, April, May, June, July, August, and September is the most. So, uh, and then October starts to come down again. So now February is the least. September is the most because we're in the southern hemisphere and our seasons are reversed. So here's the picture of February 1st, 1979. Way, way, way less ice than in at the end of their winter, which is September. So southern hemisphere winter, way more ice. And in fact, the southern hemisphere winter has even more ice than the northern hemisphere winter. And this is partly because in the southern hemisphere, the ice can keep expanding outward. It doesn't have all these continents that are kind of confining it like the Arctic does. If you think back to the Arctic picture, the central Arctic region is surrounded by, or largely surrounded by, North America and Greenland and Europe and Asia. So it can't keep going out like the Antarctic ice can. So that's part of the reason why the Antarctic ice has more at the end of their winter than the Arctic does at the end of their winter. So um, we proceed, have the computer get all the points again and again. Um, every year, way more ice in the winter, which now for the Antarctic is the uh, July, August, September time frame, and way less ice in the summer, which is more like the February uh, time frame. So uh, that's the plot there then for the monthly average Antarctic sea ice extents for this period of this satellite record. And so now we've got these two. Um, we've got the Arctic here, and we've got the Antarctic here, and we've got great records of the monthly average sea ice extents in both. But for a scientist, that's not enough. You don't want to just have a picture showing the plot of it. You want to be able to like come up with a number to say, how has it changed? And so in the next two videos, I'm going to be showing you how we come up from these two maps, how we come up with a final number of how the sea ice covers have changed over this time period. So those, that's for the next two videos. And so I close here by uh, saying um, that I really appreciate Nick DiGirolamo for helping me uh, with the images and plots. Uh, I've listed the uh, primary data sets that I used here. And I really appreciate Jay Friedlander and Britt Griswold for uh, doing the filming today. And also want to mention that Sally Smith's the person who instigated this project at the beginning. So thank you. <laughs>